in this video, we're going to be talking about a system called the Leonard Jones gas. So the idea behind the Leonard Jones potential, which you can see here, has a minimum at some radius r min, and it diverges very steeply right here. So this is effectively a hardcore potential. The physics behind this potential is it's trying to imitate the van der Waals force that molecules and other small particles feel. It actually looks like this. It has a repulsive term that goes like 1 over r to the 12th, so that's giving us this really steep, sharp, repulsive part here. And it has an attractive piece that goes like 1 over r to the 6th. And that's responsible for this minimum and the particle radius being set here at rm. If we take minus the derivative of the potential in the x direction, we have a term that goes like x over r. We also have terms that go like 1 over r to the 13th minus 1 over r to the 7th. This is an example of one of these Leonard Jones simulations of two particles interacting with one another. So here is a collision, and the idea is that in this system, they will be conserving momentum. So the idea behind molecular dynamic simulations is that we have a number of particles, and they have energies that depend on the positions of all of the other particles. So basically what we do is we want to run an update step where we calculate the energy, find the force acting on a particle, integrate that to a new position for each particle, recalculate the energy, and so on and so forth. So if we wanted to run such a simulation, the first thing we tell our computer to do is to set up our system. So for this, we need to choose an initial configuration. We need to choose an energy scale, temperature scale, and the size of our time step. These are all important because if I want to integrate something, I need to basically step forward based on acceleration and my initial velocity. For that to integrate smoothly, the step forward I take has to be small compared with the gradient of the energy or small compared to the force acting on me. Otherwise, I'm not really doing a proper integration step. Next, I need to solve Newton's equations for each particle. I do this by saying there is some acceleration of, on each particle that comes from the force at every time step. After that, I can measure properties of the system. So what we'll be talking about later is mean squared displacement, effective temperature, different types of energies, so on and so forth. When we're selecting the initial conditions, we would like to choose um, the initial configuration randomly. So imagine we have a simulation box that starts at x min and ends at x max. We can choose positions for particles according to a flat distribution, for instance, that would evenly disperse the particles throughout this domain. Next, we want to choose our speeds. So we're going to draw our speeds from a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So in Mathematica, that is Maxwell distribution, and the width here is going to be sigma. This is what the distribution looks like. It's basically relating two energy scales here. So one is kT and one is one half mv squared, so the kinetic energy. We're basically relating the kinetic energy to temperature. And this is called the kinetic theory definition of temperature, saying that the average temperature in the system is really going to just be equal to the kinetic energy. So we can turn this around and say that based on the average kinetic energy I want or the average temperature I choose in this system, I can pick velocities from this distribution here, which will statistically have the kinetic energy I want. So these are related via 3 halves kT is going to be equal to the expected velocity squared. 
the specific integration we're going to be choosing is called Velocity Verle integration. So this is the way we're going to be discreetly updating the positions based on the forces and velocities at any given time step. So to do this, we're going to start by expanding R of T plus delta T about R of T. So the first term is just going to be the position at time T. Then we have the velocity at time T times delta T. So this would be sort of a standard discrete integration step. And then the next order term is going to be the force over 2M times delta T squared. So what we want to do is nicely calculating the force, velocity update, and position update in a single step. If we take this definition here, let's look at R of T plus delta T and R of T minus delta T, and that'll let us isolate some more terms. So when I add those two together, I end up with a relationship between my position at time T, a force at time T, and how that's going to change with a time step. If I subtract the two, I end up with two V of T plus delta T. So if I rearrange this a little bit, I can end up with the definition of a discrete derivative. So R of T plus delta T minus R of T minus delta T divided by two delta T is a discrete derivative. We're gonna do an initialization step. So first we're just gonna calculate all the initial positions, the initial velocities and the initial force acting on each particle. And then we're gonna run our integration step. It's a little bit of a strange integration step, but the point of it is that it's trying to keep the total energy fixed at every point. So if my delta T is too big as I go through this, I might end up changing my kinetic energy. So this is the algorithm. So step one is I calculate all of the half step velocities. So I update my velocities as if the force had taken them half of delta T. So that's my first step. The second step is I'm gonna update the positions of all of my particles based on this new half step velocity. So I'm gonna take my position and add to it the velocity at the half step, not the velocity at Rn, and multiply that by delta T. Then I'm gonna calculate the new forces acting on all of the particles at these new positions, R n plus one, and that's gonna give me F of n plus one. And then the last step is I'm gonna update all of the velocities for V at n plus one. And I'm gonna do that exactly the same way I found my half step velocities. I basically take my particles and I just run this over and over and over. And that is what this type of molecular dynamics does. What about boundary conditions? We can have lots of different types of boundary conditions. I can imagine having purely repulsive boundaries, so sort of Leonard Jones boundaries. So if this is my, my wall here and I can't let my particle go through it, I can take my particle here and calculate the interaction energy between it and the wall Imagine I have just the repulsive part of my Leonard Jones potential, so just the one over R to the 12th, and I'm gonna just try to integrate that. So first I can calculate what my uh, distance to the wall is in terms of X and Y, so that's R, so this is my radius term here. I'm gonna integrate it from Y is equal to minus infinity all the way through to Y is equal to infinity. And I end up with this term here, get Rm to the 12th divided by x to the 11th. And so I can take an infinite boundary on one side, an infinite boundary on the other, one on the bottom and one on the top, add all of those together, and I end up with a confining box. Another type of boundary conditions that physicists use a lot are periodic boundary conditions. We're just gonna focus on this as our simulation box, but we'd like to imagine that this is an infinite system and that there are no boundaries 
as a particle moves, it's going to feel basically forces coming from image charges in the four nearest neighbor boxes. And as it moves, you're going to translate it so it always ends up inside this simulation box. So this is what that looks like. So the particle and all of its image charges move along a trajectory. So what I want you to focus on is, I'm going to run this again, is looking at the particle as it passes this boundary here. It's going to get teleported to the boundary over here. So now pay attention to that while I play it again. So it passes the boundary, teleports over here, and continues on. With these periodic boundary conditions, the two steps we need to do is um, find the nearest neighbors of the system. So translating one simulation box to the right, to the left, to the top, and to the bottom, and use those neighbors to calculate the potential acting on any particle. The other thing is that anytime a particle leaves a simulation box, we're going to teleport it back inside like this. The very last thing we want to do is measure the physics. This is a video by Jacob Earnshaw, who's a PhD student at Sheffield Hallam University. And what he's studying in this paper is looking at how these long chain hydrocarbon molecules behave, whether or not they're confined to live inside a glass. So when they're in the glass phase, there are two things going on. One is that there are lots and lots of molecules just like this all pushed up against each other. Um, and that is uh, confining them. The other is that there is a lower temperature, which means that there's a smaller amount of kinetic energy they can use to explore their whole configuration space. In the fluid state over here, you can see that having a higher temperature means that there's a higher kinetic energy and these particles are moving around a lot more. So what we're going to be measuring is the mean squared displacement. That is the expectation value or the average of the starting position minus the position at time t quantity squared. We're going to average that for all particles in the system. And that gives us a single quantity. So what happens at short times? So at short times, you can basically turn off the interaction. So particles aren't really feeling one another. They're just going forward at a constant velocity, the same as they would in free space. And so since they're going along at a constant velocity, the change in their position is proportionate to time. So the change in their position squared is proportionate to time squared. So we get this on a log log plot, we get a slope of two. At long times, particles will start to feel each other, and this will happen through collisions. So once a particle gets close enough to another particle, it's going to use conservation of momentum and basically scatter off of it. And the idea is that these collisions can come from any direction. So an incoming particle has an equal probability of being scattered in any direction from any given collision. What this does is it changes the mean squared displacement so that at long times it scales as t. So basically what we've discovered here is that adding these interactions to a gas of particles, we give rise to diffusion. So this characteristic um, mean squared displacement that scales with time is exactly the law of diffusion.